Hi guys, it's Kelly Taylor here, and I am super excited to welcome you to the Celebrate Release YouTube Hop. Uh, this is celebrating Honeybee Stamp's ninth birthday. Today I'm going to be using the Squared Spring Florals. Uh, I'm using the stamps, the dies, and the stencils. And so uh, just to take care of some business before <laughs> we get into the card making, um, today we are doing two $50 gift card giveaways to the comments along the hop. Uh, everything is linked below in the description, so just make sure you keep hopping along and leaving some love as you go to be entered. Winners will be drawn um, and announced on April 8th. So... This set I really love. Stencils are super popular right now. I know not everybody is a colorist, even though I love coloring. And normally when I would, you know, use an outline image like this, I would color it myself. Um, but I think a lot of times the stencils get looked at as a way just to, you know, add color to a white card base. And I kind of wanted to do something different and show you that you can use the stencils and incorporate them with other techniques that you know and love. So today we're going to be doing, um, it's an emboss resist um, with the gold. So I am working on Canson Monteval watercolor paper, um, and I'm going to be stamping one of them, and one of them we're just going to do is kind of a soft background. So uh, watercolor paper is typically pretty textured, and so I am stamping it twice after I treated it with my anti-static tool. I am using our uh, Be Creative Gold Pigment Ink, and then I am going to go ahead and emboss this in uh, gold embossing powder as well. And I like to do this twice, too, <laughs> just to make sure I got good coverage on both parts, the stamping and the embossing. Uh, I chose gold because I thought it would look nice with the color palette that I had going on, and it was something different than white. Now, this image you can do trailing down like you see it now, or you can do it like trailing up the card, uh, which is actually the orientation that I chose when I um, put my finished card together. So I always uh, preheat my heat tool. It's kind of heating up while I'm doing, um, you know, my stamping and putting the embossing powder on. So that way it just limits the amount of warping once you take your heat gun to the embossing powder because everything is nice and hot and then it melts and it's shiny and it's beautiful. So this is another piece of Canson Monteval watercolor paper and that's going to be our soft background. Now I chose to do Distress Oxides for this because oftentimes when you're using black, if you try to watercolor with oxides or stencil with oxides over a black image, um, you end up dulling the black because these do have dye and pigment properties but because we're using the embossing it's not something I have to worry about and the oxides do dry back kind of much softer um, so I'm using these for my watercolor for this piece, I am putting water all over my background. Uh, you certainly could cut a larger piece and tape it down, but I'm just going to hold it and hold it with my finger, quite honestly, because uh, I'm not that fancy. Um, but then I'm just going to, you know, pick up a couple of colors and kind of drop them in. Now, when you are looking at what colors you want to use, I chose pinks and purples um, because that's not something that I typically use a lot of or that you know those colors together so I was looking to try something a little different um, but when I selected my greens I intentionally selected greens that were more on the yellow green side um, and the reason I did that was because I knew it would work well with my pinks um, so that way I wouldn't have to pay too too much attention about where I kind of dropped the color so even though I have wet the entire background, some of it is kind of drying around the edges as I'm going through and just picking up color and dropping it in. Um, and so if that happens to you, you know, if you want your color to spread, you have to have wet paper. It's only going to spread where, you know, where the water is. So I just pick up clean water. I go back in. I make sure to put the clean water around the edges first and then bring it in to where the pigment is if I have to re-wet after I already have color down. 
So this is the crushed olive, like I said, much, much yellower um, than a lot of greens, but it really pops with that purple and the pink. It looks really nice together. Um, and then the mode lawn, um, again, it is another yellow green. So this is just going to give us, you know, a little bit of deeper color, not quite so bright. Um, I started to get like this halo of green around the edges, which I did not love. Uh, so I just went back in and picked up a little bit more of the um, picked raspberry and the kitsch flamingo and just kind of dropped that in. This isn't going to be the only color that we're adding, so I'm not overly concerned with making sure it's really saturated. Um, this is going to be the background to our dye and then the texture underneath our flowers. But since we will be adding more, um, I'm not overly concerned about making sure it's super pigmented. Though this is pretty and you could totally leave it like this. I do add some spatters in there um, because I feel like it gives me more organic blooms of color in different areas. Uh, but you could skip that step if you're a person who likes a little bit more control. So I'm going to set this aside and I'm going to work on the background piece. So for this piece, I'm doing the same thing. I'm wetting the entire paper and this time I, def I want it to be much softer than even what we've just done. So I'm going to just randomly set down color. This is not going to be pretty. <laughs> it's not going to be pretty um, when we're doing it. But that's the thing about watercolor. You have to work through that ugly stage because it get it does get pretty. Um, but oftentimes we have a really hard time leaving it alone and letting the water do the work because we want to be in control. And so when it's in the stage like this where it's really very ugly, um, we don't leave it alone. I am going to add a little bit more water just because I want it to be really soft. Um, and then I'll use my, uh, what is this? my microfiber towel just to kind of sap up the extra water and then I'm going to dry it with a heat tool. If you have time, you could absolutely let this just air dry, um, but I'm, you know, going from one to the other. So I want to be able to put my card together <laughs> in the amount of time that I can. But you can see, um, you know, already those colors are a whole lot softer than the first round that we did. Um, and like I said, totally intentional. I am going to make Make sure that this is just completely dry before I move on to my next step. I'm not spending a lot of time in one area. I'm not trying to reheat my embossing powder. I'm just trying to make sure that my paper is dry. Now, here's something that I've learned. I'm using the Alta New Sticky Mat to hold my stencils, but something that I've learned just through practice is... Um, these aren't really great, and I, I don't think any of them are, quite honestly. The sticky mats um, aren't great at holding watercolor paper, so I did have to tape mine down. Honeybee, with this release, released some new uh, detailed blending brushes. They released um, what they're calling it a number 7, a number 5, and a 10, and I'm going to be using those today, and I'm also going to be using the smallest brush from their detailed blending brushes. So here, this first layer is the leaves and the flower centers. Now, I'm not worried about the flower centers because I know that I'm going to go in there with a darker brown. Um, so I'm not overly worried about getting the green on there. But if you were, um, you would just use one of those smaller blending brushes. But since um, I know that I'm going to go over it with a, a darker brown, I'm not worried about it at all. So I put down my first color, which was Mode Lawn. That's, you know, we're just repeating the colors that we have seen in the background. And then I'm adding just a little bit of shading with the Rustic Wilderness. For the centers, I'm going to use this Walnut Stain. Um, this is a bit of a cooler, darker brown. You could do yellow, but I didn't want to fight with the yellow, you know, and the like the colors in the background. Yellow isn't really going to work really well with the purple. So, but the brown works with everything. And so that's why I chose this one. And this is the number seven brush that I'm using here. As stenciling has gotten more popular, you know, these kind of detail brushes are really a lifesaver because it allows you to get into those smaller areas. 
So once that one's done, I'm just going to line up the next stencil. If you're not familiar with Honeybee's stencils, um, they're perfectly clear, but they are also etched and they have the whole design etched on them. So it makes them so much easier to line them up. Plus they have the guidelines around the edges as well. Um, and then for the next, um, for the flowers, I'm going to be using a combination of picked raspberry and seedless preserves, and then also um, wilted violet and villainous potion. Uh, so some of these colors are colors that we've seen in the background. Um, and then like the Villainous Potion is just a darker uh, version. So that way they pop a little bit more. And the reason that I have switched from Distress Inks or from Distress Oxides to Distress Inks is because one, Distress Inks are brighter. They don't dry back as soft. And two, they are transparent which allows us to see that watercolor texture that we've created through the color we're, that we're adding on top, which gives it a more hand-painted or kind of painterly look um, than just being, you know, straight color stenciled on to our background. Um, so just another way to kind of get some more mileage out of your stamps by doing, you know, these different techniques. Or maybe you don't love a watercolor look and you, you know, want to just do the embossing and then do the stenciling over. That'd be great too. Um, or like I said before, you don't have to do the stenciling. You could just do the dropping in, you know, the pigment um, and do the emboss resist, and that would be really pretty. Just lots of options, um, which is why I like these ones that have the, the, the stamp and the die and the stencil. Um, so this is all pretty much straightforward. Now, you, I will tell you, um, for the most part, I didn't pay any attention to like where the color was. Um, you know, if they if I was doing a layer of pink flowers, then I just did them pink. But there's this one flower, this one right here that I'm doing, that is in a very green area and I'm putting purple over it and it is looking so brown, y'all. It's looking super brown. <laughs> super brown. Like my poor little spring flower is on the verge of death. Um, and so I like I'm going to go in, I'm going to do this layer, see if it gets any better. P.S. It doesn't. Oh, spoiler alert. Um, and so if you have a situation like that where maybe your colors in the background, you know, because we just dropped them in kind of organically, aren't really vibing with the colors that you are putting over top of it, then you can layer, because these are transparent, you can layer another color over top. And so for that specific flower, I am going to go in and I'm going to add some, like, can you see it right there? It's like right in the middle of the bottom square. Um, I'm going to go in and I'm going to add some uh, picked raspberry. And this is going to tone that purple to be more on the pinker side, which will then work nicely with that yellow that's in the background. Now, it does mean that I have to go back and get the previous stencil, um, but it's only for that one flower, so it really didn't take any time at all to line it up and go over it with the pink, and then I was much happier with the way that that was looking. Uh, so if you, you know, if that happens to you, you can totally go in and everything is fixable. You guys watch my videos, you know that. Um, and so... This one, this layer, you know, I did, I chose to do the pink. And you can make this as light or as dark or as bright as you would like. Um, I am a person who is a sucker for brighter colors, especially in florals. Um, and so that's why I chose the colors that I did. But this, you could definitely do this more muted as well. There's a lot of different, you know, options here. Um, and then moving on to the next stencil, um, and again, using those pinks, um, I really, it, like, you ever get stuck in, like, a color combination? I have been stuck recently in some color combinations of using kind of the same thing over and over again. Um, and so I really wanted to kind of break out of that and do something different than I would normally do. Um, 
just because I feel like, you know, this card would look totally different in a pink, orange, yellow, you know, um, and it's good to, to just kind of break out of what you know. So all of the stenciling is done at this point, and we're going to move on to picking the sentiment. Now, all of these will kind of fit into this little square. I chose the happy birthday. I chose it on purpose because happy birthday cards are the cards that I use most often in real life. And so I'm going to gold heat emboss this on vellum. Um because it matches the gold embossing in the background. Now, I I played around with the idea of doing white embossing on a gold metallic cardstock, um, but I really didn't want to cover up the watercolor behind it. Uh, you'll see, I got, a, I got a little trick for how I fixed that. Um, so once again, I treated my vellum, I stamped twice, and then I'm going to use that same gold embossing powder. Uh, and because vellum is super thin and does not take very much time at all, your sentiment will heat up right away. Um, and you just want to make sure that you, you know, you keep it moving so that way you don't warp your vellum, especially if you're not using a heavier weight vellum. Um, it can curl up on you and you can melt it. So now I'm going to use the coordinating dies to cut everything out. For the squared spring florals, you can either cut out the whole piece and leave the center intact, or you can cut out the center as well. I am going to cut out both, and as long as you um, line them up correctly, you should be able to cut out both at the same time. That is what I did. I wasn't sure if I wanted to save that piece in the middle or if I wanted to use the lighter background behind it. And so I figured I would just cut them both out. And then if I wanted to keep this piece, this darker piece uh, in the background, I could just fit it back in. So now these are cut out and I'm just going to set this little piece, like I said, because I didn't didn't know what I was doing yet. Um, I'm going to set that piece to the side once I get the, t the tape off, right? And then um, you'll be able to see, like we no longer have that white border. It has that watercolor border. So we could go this way or we could go this way. Ultimately, I like this way better. And so that is the way that I ended up doing it. And then you could just fit that piece right back in there. Um, and I did find that I liked the darker one better. Now for the happy birthday, it does cut out the, the uh, letters individually. So if you wanted to piece them back together to make birthday one word, you absolutely could. Um, if you were using it on another card design. But I really wanted to pop this up, and consequently I wanted to pop up my sentiment. But it's really hard to pop up vellum, because you can see everything right through it. So I needed to get something behind it, except I didn't love the white. Um, it just covered up too much of the watercolor. So here's what I ended up doing. It's not perfect. It's not 100%, but it does work. Um, I just use similar colors of Copic markers to kind of color, like I looked at the background where they were all laying. That's why I have them laid out there um, so that I could kind of blend them together. This does not have to be perfect. You guys can see my coloring here is not great. And so I laid it on top and I put it back in to see if it would work. And the green was just a little too bright and needed to be more yellow. Um, and so I'm going to bring in the yellow and just go right over top of that, as well as adding just a little bit of purple on those edges. Um, once again, this is not an exact science. It does not have to be an exact science. Uh, it will still work really nicely because the vellum is going to soften everything anyway, but then it allows your vellum to look like it has popped up and it is part of the watercolor background without you losing that very pretty watercolor center. Um, so here in building everything together, I am going to put adhesive, which is just um, liquid glue, and I'm just very carefully dotting it behind the embossing, uh, because like I said, with vellum, you can see any of the adhesive, so we don't want that. Um, so I'm going to put that down on the faux watercolor that we've created with the Copic markers, um, and just be very careful not to get the adhesive anywhere else. Um, I think I have seen somewhere that they have like clear vellum um, 
like clear pop-ups that you can put behind vellum. I've never tried them though, uh, and I'm not sure how well that works, but this worked for me in this specific situation. So maybe it'll work for you in another situation if you should find yourself in that uh, position. So I'm going to use the larger uh, foam dots from Honeybee, and I'm just going to cover this whole thing. I'm over generous with my foam dots, I know that, but I can't stop myself. So first things first, I'm just going to lay this in place um, while I put my in my little square insert in. Um, because I'm going to be gluing that down flat and then have the flowers popped up over it. So I'm just going to hold this in place while I kind of tuck this in uh, and get it lined up so that it's seated flat against the card and then the flowers pop up you know, over top of it, because then we'll pop up the uh, sentiment that will also go into that little square. Um, this the, the little tabbies make this so easy to just, you know, pull them off and pop them up. So this just snugs right into the corner. It's a pretty much like edge to edge design on an A2 size card. Um, and then I will also add, I'm going to trim these down. I do this pretty often uh, with these larger foam circles. I'm going to trim them down to put behind my sentiment and then we'll arrange them the same way that we, you know, would have, uh, you know, the same way that the die cut has them so that it fits really nicely in that little square. Um, and I'll use my tweezers to do that. I'm just making sure it's lined up on my grid mat so that I know everything is straight and I'm not pushing anything down until I'm sure, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, because I don't want, you know, anything to be kind of off. It's sometimes it's hard to see when you're doing it and not looking at it upright. Sometimes it can be hard to see whether it is straight or not. Um, I did have with the day, because remember, I'm using mine upside down. Um, I did have with my day where it overlapped the edge of my floral just a little bit, um, but it was not problematic. Then in order to finish this off, I added a little bit of shimmer to the flower centers. And I also pulled out um, the, they have some really great ones with this release, but actually the previous ones, the previous release, the Vintage Love Gems, um, the little goldish yellow ones matched my project much better. So I just grabbed those and I just did three nice and simple, kind of, you know, put them into the corners to accent my sentiment. And then that's it. That's the whole card. So thank you guys so much for joining me. I always appreciate your time. You will see me again shortly, but in the meantime, follow the link below to hop to the next stop on the hop and the best of luck in winning the gift cards. I will catch you guys on the next video. Bye.